Sometimes you need to take control to make a difference. That's why with FlexPath from Capella University, you're in control. Set your own deadlines and leverage your experience to move at a pace that works for you. Discover a different way forward at capella.edu. There was a lot of things like that where you'd think, what the f***? From Stuff, a new 12-part documentary podcast. He was into sex every day. The Commune. Sex, drugs, and a guru called Bert. There are crimes, but this isn't a whodunit, it's a why done it. Good God, adults agreed to this? The Commune. Find it now on your favourite podcast platform or at stuff.co.nz slash the commune. You've already been welcome to Centre Point. Twenty-four hours ago I found out the person that I've been dating for the last six months is a con man. That is my sister Emma. Andrew Tonks's lies had been so convincing, she'd invested $300,000 with him. However, the tables were about to turn on Andrew. What he didn't know was that Emma had discovered his real identity. But to get any chance of justice, Emma had to act like it was business as usual. Coming up in this series... And that's when murder, Mm. all this stuff goes through my mind. I'm really, really scared. I'm assuming Sarah has watched too much Netflix and figures I've been defrauding you. Couldn't be further from the truth. That's what this was, a real-life story that seems so unbelievable, but it was actually true. A true story that all starts with one simple swipe to the right. I'm Sarah Ferris. And I'm Emma Ferris. And this is my story, Conning the Con. Hello, listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. I'm your speaker, Casey, and a huge, massive welcome to my newest patrons, Morgan and Cherry at Crimepedia True Crime Podcast, which I absolutely love. Hello to Lizzie, who I hope to work with more in the future, and a big welcome to Shannon. Thank you for chatting with me about beautiful birds after the sudden loss of one of our cockatiels last month. I hope you all enjoyed the backlog of content with more monthly exclusives on the way. Today's episode is with Katie, who talks to us about her experiences within One Taste. Our conversation highlights many important things that I feel I should note here. The need for more conversations with people about what healthy sex looks like and feels like, about consensual relationships, and about how to feel good in our own bodies. I can't express how much I have gone back to this conversation in my own mind, especially during the recent conversations worldwide about bodily autonomy. So without further ado, here is Katie. So hi, Katie, and thank you so much for agreeing to come and chat with me today after our mutual friend Esther put us in touch. Today we are going to be discussing a group that has been explored on the show before, but in this instalment we have your female perspective. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Hey, Casey. Thank you so, so much. And thank you so, so much, Esther, who I hope will listen to this later. She already said she would. Um, And so, yes. Hi, I'm Katie. And I am in Austin, Texas, across the lake. And I am a therapist here in Austin. I am 40. Do you have a a specific um, field of, of therapy that you work within or is it sort of a just a generalized practice yeah I mean I'm definitely growing my knowledge base of religious trauma and cult recovery but I wouldn't say that's my specialization at this time I'd say I'm more specialized with people who have disordered eating and maybe some body dysmorphia and um, addiction is my background addiction recovery as well Wow. So it sounds like you're sort of like a therapist with many different hats almost. Yeah, for sure. That's amazing. And being somebody that works in the space of helping others in recovery, is it sort of a tumultuous time for you right now, polit- like politically in that area of the world? I mean, it's it. We, we're only getting what the media kind of wants Mm. to portray over here so it's difficult to know really how people are feeling over there and and if it's as contentious as it appears to be Mm. looking on the internet I mean what what does it feel like for you over there Mm. with this this Roe versus Wade Mm -hmm. atmosphere over over Texas yeah it's um it's scary and I think most people who 
believe in reproductive rights for women are very scared, very angry. And um, it's feeling very real, although it's not exactly real yet. I mean, it is real in Texas. Abortion is basically illegal here. Um, if you have one after six weeks, which is when most people figure out or make a decision around that time. So um, yes, it's very hard to be a therapist right now. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to, I'm like in a frenzy of figuring out how to keep data safe and how to have online sessions that are truly, truly um, private. Um, so yeah, it's a it's not a good time. It's a hard time and it's an uncertain time as it has been for a couple of years now. Um, but I'm glad to be honestly thinking about where I was when I was in the cult. Um, I feel like I'm in the world at this point, which feels very good. Like I feel like I'm in the issues rather than in this weird bubble that is sort of not paying attention to the issues outside. For anyone who hasn't tuned into previous episodes or hasn't heard about this group, what is the name of the movement that we're going to be discussing today? Yeah, the name of the movement, I would say, has kind of two names. One of them is orgasmic meditation, which is essentially the practice that this community of people partook in. And the other name is One Taste, which is the company that sold it, essentially, and a lot of, a lot of other things. And could you give us a brief summary of what One Taste is or, or was, who created this movement and when and how all of those things came together, how a company was established to be able to sell these workshops in the first place? Mm-hmm, right. Well, I want to say the Ruins episode, <laughs> he describes it so much better than I could because I think that he did a lot more homework in looking back at like the... The history of it but I'll tell you what I understand what I know and I would fact check anything I say because <laughs> um because I'm not great with dates and and those history but uh I believe that Nicole de Doan um was she, Nicole de Doan was the creator of what we called orgasmic meditation and was the she was the cult leader she was the she was the charismatic leader on the top of all the other charismatic leaders. And um, she created, I don't know if she called it one taste at the time. I don't think that she did, but she created this movement. And I think it definitely started more as a movement, a group of people doing wild stuff in San Francisco in the early 2000s, uh, maybe like 2000, 2000, 2005, sometime between there, maybe. And um, they were just doing crazy experimental stuff, like a bunch, dozens of people living together in very close quarters, having all sorts of sex, having a lot of um, open relationship and doing this practice, orgasmic meditation, which I should probably describe just because it, you can say to me, I say orgasmic meditation. I know exactly what that means. And uh, nobody else knows what that means. Um, Orgasmic meditation is a 15 minute partnered practice. I'm gonna try to not use the lingo. Let me just try to say this without using the lingo. So two people sit, sit down in sort of a soft space and um, the woman, there, there's somebody with a clitoris who is sort of uh, receiving the stimulation, we'll say the genital stimulation. And they basically lay, lay down and um, present themselves to, it's usually a man who is stroking their genitals. Um, this conversation is moving very quickly, by the way. <laughs> Hi, Casey, good to meet you. This is our guest meditation. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so essentially the, the person who is stroking the genitals are, is doing that for 15 minutes. And they're kind of, there's sort of a communication that's happening throughout that period of time about the basics of, um, you know, how the stroking is going, whatever the person with the clitoris is wanting or not wanting. Um, you do that communication, you do the same 15 minutes, like this, this, essentially the same thing happens every time, start, middle, finish. So do, do you have any idea of how Nicole Daydone came up with the, the practice of, of 
orgasmic meditation or OM. I know that sometimes it's shortened to that acronym. It can't just be something you wake up one day and think, I think it would be beneficial for for, for two people to take part in, in this 15 minute session where this simulation happens and the communication is present in this way. It, it, it feels like something that is kind of shaped over time. I, and I do not believe, actually I know according to Nicole, she did not actually make the practice up. Somebody asked her to do it at a party and um, she did it. And then she took it and ran with it. And I think she, she created more structure. And I think that structure changed over time. I think there was a point in time when the ohms were incredibly long. Um, and um, eventually it was shortened into this 15 minutes snippet that I think that she felt she could sell to people as a practice to do regularly. And she could have everybody in her, in her crew do themselves all the time. <laughs> very very frequently and by that you mean run run the workshops or or use the practice on themselves in a, in a kind of solo stimulation no do the practice it's always two people who do that okay. practice but essentially be able to do that practice it was woven into our whole lives and it, and she um essentially told people to weave it into their lives every day right Um, right okay yeah so what do we know about Nicole Daydone as a person what 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 do you think contributes to her having a a a cult of personality or or a charismatic personality Mm. (sighs) I don't know Nicole very well I never as most people would say I was never in her inner circle at all um no one in Austin, uh, where my community was, was really in her inner circle. People would come to visit for periods of time, maybe weeks or so max, and they were in her inner circle. But um, I only know what she reported, what she shared in the classes that I took where she was teaching. And um, I think I think that um, in some part of her world, there was sexual trauma. I think that her father was the pedophile and I think he was in prison for that. Um, and, And I also think that she believes a lot in female empowerment. And I think that was something for her that was that was healing and that she wanted she felt compelled to bring to the masses and wanted to watch that happen in her eyes for a lot of other women a lot of other people um so female empowerment sort of having sexual um relations revolve around the female and essentially maybe do some controlling of the man this is so heterocentric i realize i'm um this whole practice is completely heterocentric and also, um, yeah, uh, cisgender centric. So, um, she, yeah, I think that she wanted to empower women and she wanted to put men in their place and that was healing for her. And like most cult, she's very charismatic, very powerful, very articulate, very intuitive. Um, and those are the nice things I would say about her. And, and she, like most cult leaders, she wanted to make a world that reflected her, the healing of her trauma. That's an incredible summary that you've just given us of, uh, and insight into this m- matriarch of, of one taste. And it's interesting that you mentioned the, the sexual trauma because that was going to be something that I asked later on. The empowerment that women must feel during some of these workshops, if they if they are done in on the way that that they were promised on paper or in uh, workshops, um, where you know any of the kind of the, the 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 trauma or negativity that we discussed today is obviously not mentioned um, in these presentations and um, mm. and promotions of these workshops and even in episode 126 with Ruan when he spoke about his involvement he said it was empowering for him as well he'd never been 
in an environment where it was female focused in in the way that one taste was so for you to mention that a lot of the practices could be based on previous trauma that the leader had experienced is is interesting in itself I think especially when you consider some of the subject matter that Ruan mentioned towards the end of the episode around actually abusing members of the group which kind of makes one taste feel like it, it goes in a full circle from from sort of Nicole's childhood through to how Ruan's episode ended Mm-hmm. It, at your point in life when you come across um one taste whichever way we we refer to it today what 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 had happened in your life to lead you up to that point a lot of the time on the show we we speak to second and third generation members of of cults or high demand groups who are born into these things but of course that's not the case here so uh, was there anything significant that you can pinpoint where you think ah that was a potential factor in me kind of being swooped up to, into this thing or or was it kind of a, a a very organic thing yeah I would say my beginning of being in the cult was pretty dramatic a pretty dramatic point in my life and a pretty I would say like a stereotypical time that people are especially vulnerable to being pulled into a cult Um, that maybe within weeks of me starting to be involved in the cult, I had a really traumatic breakup that I did not see coming Three year relationship, just boom, ended. And before that relationship had started, I had also decided I was going to stop drinking. And, um, I had my friend group at that point was basically revolving around drinking. Oh. And so when I can't, when I was going into that relationship, I was losing my friendships and I did not have much community around me. Um, I was also really, you know, that was, I was very deep. I had been very deep in my work because as a therapist, I don't know if this is true over there, but as a therapist, once you graduate from college, which is, pretty rigorous you have to do like two to three years of essentially working for almost nothing and being under supervision before you're an an official therapist and so I was just just in the first few years of being an official therapist and in a state of burnout and I've never been particularly close with my family so I I was very alone very alone and very much in pain and grieving and looking for a family, looking for a, a group that I could feel myself in and feel um, resonant with. And that's that was what I found. <laughs> and how how does that introduction play out? Is this a group that you were aware of already existing in your area? Was it a mutual contact, somebody on the street? I was not aware at all. Right. Okay. It just feels like a. Um, <laughs> it feels like a very strange thing. Like if somebody came up to you and said, "Hey, want to come and have your clitoris stroked for fifteen minutes?" I feel like that's <laughs> not the sort of thing that people can come up to you on the street to to try and sell in the way that somebody might say, "Have you heard the word of God?" And you say, "Oh, I'm a." a, a you know, a, a faith-based person. I resonate with, with, you know, w- what you're wanting to have a discussion about, but I feel like you can't really evangelize in the same way with people on the street when it comes to on um, workshops. hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that was definitely my initial reaction. I think the first I, I came into connection with just their literature on the, the app uh, meetup which uh, do y'all have that over there? Maybe, maybe. It's kind of like technology that helps you be in connection with people who have like a common uh, interest. Right. So, so if I wanted mm-hmm. to come and play board games somewhere, I could go on meet yes. up and I'd be able to find a group of people that want to play board games with me. 
Yes. That sounds great. So it also felt... sounds quite dangerous, <laughs> though. So good. <laughs> yeah, in, in situations like this one, it can be a little dangerous. Uh, the board games one, it's probably harmless, um, usually. But yeah, there, I think I think the one taste would typically sort of the, the front the front of the like the the shop window is not what's what's in the shop window is not orgasmic meditation. It's a turn on event like these adult games that for connection. And for me, it was women's group, which felt even safer than that. Um, and they do mention orgasmic meditation at the bottom. We'll say, go through the whole spiel. It's a 15 minute practice, blah, 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 blah. And they'll tell you the graphic details of it in a meetup description. But to me, I was like, okay, I'm not doing that. But I do want to go to this women's group. And just, you know, when they tell you, it, you will heal your relationship with your body, you will be able to achieve intimacy in relationships, you will um, be more connected to both women and men alike. Um, it's just all the, it's just like this, all this talk of how it will transform you. And then that was like, yeah, that's 100% what I want. Sign me up. Yeah. That sounds like uh, maybe, I don't know if this is entirely true. People might disagree if they're listening, but that sounds like what every woman wants from the age that they develop body image issues right up until present day isn't that just what every maybe even every person wants is just to feel comfortable with how they look and how they are and and what they eat and how they communicate with other people like that that yeah so offering you yes. the answers to, to to all of life's questions yes Absolutely. Yeah, that was, it, it was just speaking exactly, exactly what I needed at that point in my life. And I would imagine that most people as they're kind of coming into the group, that's, that's where they are. And you said that you were sort of seeking community, friendships, family, that, that part of, of your life that you felt was, was missing at that moment in time. So to go to a women's group where other women are looking to heal in the same way of course there's kind of that insinuation that this could be where you find kinship through people that you have common interests with or common issues with um not necessarily trauma bonding but i i don't know <laughs> if there's a word for um something that would make people connect through the issues that they have as a therapist, mm -hmm. there's probably a word out there somewhere. Somebody, if you know the word, listeners, email in and let me know. Um, <laughs> so you 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 go to this this first session, and what what is that like for you? How many people are there? How long does it last? Mm. Yeah, it was a women's group. Was my first event, and it was maybe 25, 20 to twenty five women. It lasted an hour and a half, I think, was what women's group always lasted. And it was like nothing I'd ever experienced before That in that um, there was so much honesty. There was so much intimacy. There was like physical intimacy, like non-sexual physical intimacy between women. There was t discussion about all of these real things that we deal with. Um, from heartbreak to relationship strain to sex to um oh my gosh so many things that to trauma and sexual trauma it was all talked about and the space that was created was it was well held you know that space was it, it wasn't like nobody was getting scared of like oh this is outside the lines like it was it was well held it was held lovingly it was held without fear um, and so I, yeah, I, I touched something that I couldn't walk away from at that point. Wow. That sounds incredible. That, that sounds, it's, it's so difficult when we get to these parts of people's stories where they talk about having these experiences and then sometimes how those sessions will be sort of used against the individual later on. I don't know if that's true in your case, 
if if the people kind of leading the workshops were taking notes at all or kind of mm-hmm. listening into the conversations where you're openly talking about past traumas and possibly ill mental health um all of the things that could later be used ag- against you when you're in the throes of coercion and undue influence right absolutely and i think later on i was more aware of the fact that when there's a new person in the group there's a whole bunch of back back room conversation about that person between groups you know large groups of people it's like a think tank essentially of how do we sell this person how do what is how do we hook this person what does this person appeal to um, where is this person what are their wounds um and yuck yeah oh, it just yuck. makes my skin crawl yeah and i think there was a lot of belief that what was being sold was transformation and and growth and and in some ways yes that's that's arguable it's arguably the case for many people and yeah, it's also coercive and really backhanded and really not transparent, very manipulative. Um, I don't, I don't know if that if knowledge of what was going on would have actually even swayed me at that point. I was so immediately uh, sold and like ready to just give everything to it. Um, which is a weird vibe in the first place. The fact that that was what I felt I needed says something about the vibe that was going on. This is like boundaryless. It's really vibe. unfortunate as well in the way that the, the the product that's created from this sessions is is a great product to market and safe and helpful. Perhaps maybe under the guise of professionals. Um, I'm not sure if any of the leadership were trained in understanding some of the themes and topics that some of the participants might have been discussing in these workshops and I don't know if you would need somebody to kind of oversee it just to make sure that you know people weren't reliving past traumas and then leaving the workshops and not really knowing what to do with any of that stuff I'm not sure what that would look like but it's unfortunate Mm -hmm. that that's not how the sessions could stay because that perhaps might have been all that you needed in that time in your life without everything else that came after right right exactly and and to answer that question of the training that people had I would say of the people that I knew I would I would say there were maybe two of us who were trained in some sort of trauma um, awareness and neither of us were particularly major leaders um, of the, of the community we both had jobs <laughs> we both had, we both had uh work outside of the community that we were that we loved and um no none of these people actually knew what they were doing right. in terms of trauma in terms of opening somebody up and knowing how to close things back um nobody knew nobody had a degree in psychology or in counseling or psychiatry anything like that that leads us perfectly into to my next question I I was going to ask if you have a rough idea of how many of you were present in that session and how many people would have identified as leadership or people running the workshops and what what Mm -hmm. gave them authority to do so were they were they trained by Nicole over in in New York or, or wherever and then moved over to to Texas or did they go from Texas to the east coast to spend some time over where everyone else was was doing the main bulk of things what what, what did that look like in terms of the workshop contribution right yeah I'd say in that group of 20 to 25 there were probably about six women who would identify as leaders and um i would say all of them or most of them lived in the house that this was like the community house um where both men and women lived and 
I would say what separated a leader from a non-leader was probably having completed the coaching program, which was um, the program alone was somewhere between 10 and $12,000. Um, and that does not account for having to go to either New York or San Francisco and spend a weekend there every month for 10 months. Um, so the final bill is somewhere around probably 20 grand, maybe more. Um, those folks were looked at as the uh, exalted <laughs> leaders, the, the people who were in the in crowd. Um, and yeah, many people in Austin, including myself, went through that program. Oh, wow. So the, the way that you've pitched it there sounds as if in hindsight, people are paying for status or, or people are paying for a certain position within the hierarchy of, of OM. Would you say that's a, a fair assumption? I'd say that's definitely a part of it. Um, that's, that's definitely a part of it on the community level. You're definitely a big dog if you've been to the coaching program. Um, on the personal level, I think a lot of us did the coaching program as a way to just go deeper into your own transformation and growth. Mm -hmm. Especially myself included. if you believe in the work, you want to be able to provide that to other people as well and know how to do that in the way that the, the, um, uh, teaches you to do it properly. Right, exactly. And I think, I don't think really anybody in the group was not interested in like healing or growing and growing. And that was always sort of ad marketed as like, well, that's the thing you need to do to keep going. You know, if you really want to do this work, that's, that's what you need to do. That'll take you there. Um, and um, I think that that's a lie personally. Like, I think that that was actually a lie. I don't think that I need it. It definitely taught me things. I, I got, I had a rich experience. Um, but, uh, no, I don't think that it was worth a year's worth of college tuition or more wow. to be doing that. When you <laughs> put it that way as well. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of money. It's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a deposit for a house in this country. Like a, in the yeah. area I live in, it's a deposit for a three bedroom house with a driveway and a big back yard. Yeah. Yeah. Here it's a, here it's like a decent car. And um, yeah, you probably about a year of, of accredited college education. And I'm guessing this coaching workshop or this coaching program, it, it, it's not something that's offered to you immediately. It, is, it, is it something that comes after time or do they kind of flirt the idea throughout various different workshops that you attend with the, with the women's group? You know, I, I think... I think for anyone who wanted to do it immediately, they absolutely could. And I would say there, I did see some people come through who did just want to go straight for that and had the money and just could and did. Um, but again, this was all methodically done. So it's like, oh, this person needs to go slow or like this person has the money. Uh, they're charged about money. I put in quotation marks because it, money was seen as like this energetic thing. It wasn't a real thing. It's like money's just energy. Um, and so, you know, for me, there was very little direct conversation about it. And I would put a million dollars on the fact that that was very strategically done because I'm, they just knew that I'm somebody who doesn't respond well to pressure. And so for me, that pressure came through my boyfriend at the time, I, I sort of, uh, connected with a, a boyfriend in the community pretty quickly who happened to also be the sister, the brother of the, the leader of the community who would eventually buy the affiliate for, of Austin. Um, there's some pressure who came, that came through him. And um, yeah, I would say just little light touches here and there about how amazing it is. And do, do you wanna go? Everybody knew I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was just a matter of of like get getting me there right and so gently <laughs> so after this initial session where you're hooked and you're 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 kind of feeling all in a, a, about the group that you found is the first session free and and after you're hooked they they charge you or are the sessions free and it's the coaching programs and things that you pay for what what does the is there like a subscription service yeah I don't I think that women's group was free at that point I think maybe later it started costing like five or ten dollars um I think turn-ons cost ten dollars um but that is all sort of getting you hooked so that you will take what's called the, what was called like how to own course. It had a couple names through the years, but there's a $200 course. I paid like 159 for it or something. Um, that is sort of like a half day, half day or a whole day. Couldn't, re- can't remember, maybe a whole day course that is teaching you how to do the practice properly and you also watch two people do the practice in the middle of the room, um, which is a huge dramatic sight and scene that I will never forget. Um, that ju- it just, oof, oof, oof. So yeah, that's kind of the first paid thing that you do. Um, and then of course there's just always more, there's always more things after that, between that and the coaching program or what have you. So after your first women's meeting, how do things progress to the point where you go to this, uh, uh, how to, how to, how to (laughs) own, um, presentation. I don't mm-hmm. know what 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 way you would display. I don't know what's the appropriate language to use when you're talking about, you know, such things. Yeah, yeah. You mean the um kind of doing the ohm in public there in in the class. Also reminded me of when my friend went over to Amsterdam and it's funny if she's listening to this she went over to Amsterdam and she was like wow I'm gonna pay to go to a sex show um because I'm just really intrigued of what these sex shows are like so she chose a mature couple to go and watch she said that it was just like like you've just said everybody's just standing around in a circle just kind of watching this thing play out yes yeah and yeah it's a really good question of like how do you get from just due to doing through your everyday life and like, yeah, of course I want some growth to like being willing to do that. Um, and I think there, the events, the women's group, you know, there are these specifically structured games in these groups. And part of the structure is like, it's an intense, intimate experience. It's basically like you're doing something that scares you. So you're revealing something that scares you. You're telling something to, directly to someone else something that scares you or that you would be very taboo in the out there world where there's social norms and people are trying to be on their best behavior um and so you're basically being built up to that point of taking your pants off in a room and allowing someone to stroke your genitals with someone else watching because when you're in that class there is a coach who's sitting there between your legs watching the thing happen. Wow. That is, I, I tried to put myself in that situation, but as you said, it's not just something you kind of don't just jump sort of A to A, a to Z. There's a lot of stuff that happens in between. You mentioned turn-ons. Mm-hmm. What, what are those sessions? Are they, they, they different to the, the actual practice sessions? Yeah, there's no practice. There's no ohm in those turn-ons. There weren't. I don't don't think they exist anymore, but uh, it's just a really specific, exact same thing that happens every time. It's three games, uh, three like relationship intimacy building games. And there's usually, they were usually in Austin, somewhere between like 10 and 20 people in that room and they would play those games. And there, it was just a lot uh a lot of group mentality and a lot of 
a lot of sort of boundaries would be broken, usually in a good way. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're sales events. They're sales events to figure out who there is going to go on and do more. It sounds quite similar to some of the footage that, that, that came out in the World Wild Country documentary around Osho and, and Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh when people would go into these workshops and really just push themselves in ways that made them feel extremely uncomfortable. Nicola Ranson mm-hmm. talked about it in, in her memoir, A Slice of Orange, where the person she was dating at the time kind of just got undressed and then looked at her and she was like, um okay and then all of a sudden she's in this room with no clothes on just you know out of her comfort zone and and then just found a way to feel comfortable confident and comfortable with it and then over time it just became something that was um quite quite normal and typical for 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 those workshops did you attend some of these turn-ons and that's how you, you were kind of encouraged to to attend the the own session or was it when you were were dating the brother at this point and he introduced you to the home session no it was even before that I just went to I basically was after several women's groups I was willing to kind of venture out into another class that also had men in the room and I was building this up of like I was like I do not know what sort of men are doing this practice but I do not trust them and um I do not want to meet them or know them. I'm good with just hanging out with the women. And uh, I, there was a class called, I think it was called the Art of Intimacy. And we did all these games. We like shuffled around the room and then you would like whisper a secret in three people's ears. And I like did that. And I really like pushed my comfort zone and did like this long, like a minute or more of, of just prolonged eye contact with somebody which has always been something that's very intense for me to do and so yeah at the end of that you're in a certain state that causes you to make extreme decisions and that is when the sales team womps on you <laughs> that's that's when the sales team comes over and offers you the intro to own class and that's when I bought it Aww. was was after that class yeah so during these on um, sessions workshops the men stay fully closed there's it, there's no sexual gratification in terms of sort of phys- physical release for the man in these sessions right because it's hard to know if this is if people are paying for these sessions and the women are kind of uh, allowing their bodies to be stimulated in such a way or receiving stimulation in such a way then I'm sure that there's a way to look at it where it could be viewed as sex work or prostitution. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone frame it in that way. I think the reason that it hasn't is because, well, this is for the woman. This is the woman receiving something. Um, And also the, I think things were set up financially So that besides the how to own course, there was no money exchanged except for in that class. And so, and you did not have to own in that class. Um, That was made pretty clear, even though you kind of, after that day, you kind of wanted to be a badass and do it yourself instead of being like, no, I went to all that trouble, but I'll maybe do it later for my first time or something. But yeah, I mean, probably the the financial piece is like there's not a there's not real money being given or taken around an actual ohm um, that would make it not quite sex work. Probably, maybe does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it was just kind of a thought that I had around how when creating the the company and detailing what the you know how the money is made from the company I'm I'm sure that they had to be very clever in the way that they worded things in in sort of a a legal sense but from the the tactics that have been used already you know you you just mentioned there that the sales team were coming down on you when you were in like a trance-like state so I'm not surprised that 
there is just such a a, a a high level of of intellect going into how to make these um how to make this movement foolproof in the way that it was um a lot of ne- nefarious practices coming through in this episode um and uh, it's 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 really f- fascinating for me to to hear your perspective as as somebody that experienced it from a, from the, f- the female point of view um so the sales team they they dive on you and you you pay the money and mm-hmm. and then you go to your 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 first session yeah yeah and then the madness really began and and uh yeah it's like the next level of intensity and you know watching people ohm in a room full of people just watching um I would say was one of my first experiences of real, real blatant like dissociation of of, like, this is way too much. This is way beyond what I'm capable of like processing in the moment right now. And over the years, I probably watched, um, God, what did they call it? Um, A demo, they called it a demo demonstration and I probably watched 50 of them over the years. I was in around for five years and um, God, it wasn't until maybe the last five that I was even in the room. They're just too much. It's too much. There's so much intention put into it. And there's so much in the room that's like it's too overwhelming (laughs) and some people really enjoyed them and that's what got me a part of what part of the thing that got me about the practice that would make me feel like I hadn't grown enough is that some people were in that room and they were like this is real cool you know like they they were in their bodies and they weren't you know they weren't freaking out like I was um and you would run into people like that and you'd be like okay, I'm not sexually free. I am not, I have so much work to do. Um, like there, there are certain people who are so much more comfortable with this wacky experience. And so, you know, more, more fodder for the fire to keep going. Do you feel like now when you reflect on those situations or, or through your journey of sort of deconstruction after this, this five-year misadventure, do you feel like people were saying that because that's what they thought they should be saying? Because it it, it appears progressive, it appears um, you know empowering for for the for the woman. It's like pushing boundaries in terms of of like being prudish um, and and bringing sort of sex into the forefront where it's still quite taboo. Like I'm I'm clearly a little bit uncomfortable sort of trying to work out what is the correct terminology to use to make sure that I'm not being uh, crude about the subject or, um, you know, making sure that I'm trying to remain sensitive towards you as an individual when we're discussing your body in an intimate way and the individuals that you, you know, came to call your family as well. It's important to remember that. But at the same time, you know, talking about female masturbation and things like that is not something that people have in these everyday conversations. So do you feel like people are saying, wow, this is so cool. It's just what people thought they should be saying in those situations to appear normal or to appear cool and relaxed? Maybe. Maybe, I mean, I think something I learned through being so connected with so many people through intense experiences is that I'm not a person who at that point had like a shutdown valve of like, this is too much and I know how to check out uh, kind of thing. It's like, I, I did not have that defense, which made this experience really overwhelming, especially going into the coaching program, way too overwhelming. Um, and I think you had to do that. Like if you didn't have that, you were really in a state of stress um, for most of the experience. And I think that some people were like me in that way, but many people just had ways of 
um, shutting down, you mm -hmm. know, sort of blocking parts of the experience so that they weren't so overwhelmed. And I think I have that now. I think the pandemic has taught me that actually. <laughs> it's like, we're so stuck. <laughs> we are so stuck. There is, it had to shut down. Like I it had to figure out ways to shut down, you know? I imagine that there's significant stress on, on your sort of mental health, well-being and psyche as well. If you're going into these demos over and over and over again and just experiencing this same sort of heightened level of, of stress or out of bodiness that 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 can't be healthy for anybody to experience on a on a you know on, not just on a single level but on a repeated on a repeated basis mm -hmm. um yeah and there's so much that I want to ask you about this first workshop that you went to and also I had a thought that Perhaps if people were coerced into thinking that they wanted to be the the people that led the demos or were involved in the demos, but then years later have realized that that's actually not what they should have been doing for themselves. That's really scary to think about, that there could mm. be individuals that are having those thoughts and feelings. I hope that that's not the case. Um, and, and, and in this session, when people are standing around saying, oh, wow, this is really cool. Is there just casual chit chat happening as this 15 no. minute demonstration plays out? No, definitely not. It's definitely like a, you know, the, the practice and the people who are doing it were very much respected, but it was also very much, it was very contained, very controlled. And um, no, it was a gripping, this is a gripping 15 minutes for sure. Um, and the, the the female stays fully dressed apart from the sort of the um waist down yeah mm. and do you just see this woman in the full throes of like orgasm good question so um in the practice of orgasmic meditation there it's pretty rare that there's an actual climax which is really uh deceiving because most people say orgasm is climax nicole had a philosophy that female orgasm is not climax it's a lot of shifting and ups and downs and um, a lot of feelings going on but climax is not necessarily a part of that at all and so it was part of the practice is to not try to have a, a climax or, or we didn't use a word orgasm because we use that to mean like something spiritual. Everything was about orgasm, um, but that didn't mean climax. So um, I think it's important to state the fact that most people uh, or most ohms did not lead to a climax. For some people they would, that's just how some women's bodies work. Um, and for most women, it, that wasn't a part really of the practice on a regular basis. Okay. I don't think I asked you on that question. So that's kind of <laughs> clarified a lot for me in, in that mm -hmm. situation. I'm not sure if in my mind, I just pictured tables of women being stimulated by men and just lots of moaning and thrashing around going on and, and, you know, women just having orgasms. Um, that's pretty in, true all the in the moaning. same room okay. yeah the moaning and the and the sound effects that is pretty common depending on the room and the level of experience when you go into the coaching program there's 150 people in there so there's 75 nests of people it's just <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> yeah when you first went to this this first workshop there's that there's that many people in the room watching this no, that was the intro to Ohm course. Right. Um, I think in my class, there were maybe 25 students or something like that. Would be right. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Right. So you've, you've paid for this session, you attend it, you're not really present throughout, but then you're supposed to be then trained in how to deliver these or participate in these workshops in the correct way. Yes, to be able to do the practice on your own, where you just go up to Jimmy and say, would you like to ohm? And you guys find a space in his apartment and you ohm and then you go home and how to do that in a way where 
you don't get into like the pitfalls of starting a relationship because you just had a sexual experience or um, yeah, basically just doing this practice as a random practice that would be like meditating together. Okay, right. So this is where things get really tricky, I think, Mm -hmm. because this is where there's the potential for people's emotions and relationships to be weaponized. Uh, I think that the way that humans work emotionally was sort of weaponized at that point because it is natural to, because you've just had an intimate experience with somebody and yeah, they might have a girlfriend in the building or, and they did, they probably, many of them did if you were going to the Ohm house to um, to like the community house to have an ohm, um, you might have been, the door might have been answered by their girlfriend or, um, and so, yeah, all, all sorts of things um, could be happening at that point. But yeah, it was made, you were made to feel wrong if you wanted something more or if you wanted to have some sort of an old, you know, a, a traditionally like conventional sort of thing around the home, like you wanted to hang out for a while or you you know, we're growing a relationship with that person that, you know, I think that became sort of counterintuitively taboo because it was quote unquote conditioning, relationship conditioning. And that anything that was like traditional relationship dynamic was totally one. You wanted to just throw that out the window and do the opposite thing. Right, and at right. that time it was open relationships. So yes, that that's really intuitive that you're like, Oh, their girl, longtime girlfriend could be in the building. Yes. That happened a lot and, um, is really screwed up. It's, it's kind of similar to information in Helen Zuman's book, mating in captivity, where she mm-hmm. talks about uh, Zendik farm having a radical take on sex and relationships where you used to have to ask or where she would ask people in positions higher than her based on the color of the wristbands that they all wore if she could have a date with somebody that she would like to have a date with and a date meant a, a sexual interaction uh, where they would go to a designated space and uh, and have sex with one another so that person would then go to the 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 potential date and say Helen would like a date with you and that person can either say yeah okay or no thank you these people might be in relationships but if there's seen so the relationships are discouraged but they still happened and if one person is repeatedly going on dates with the same person what you've mentioned there about how the the commune or the community would see that as a really negative thing and apply a, a lot of negative words to that situation is 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 very much what happened in Zendik Farm. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that that term was thrown around in a lot of different ways. And yeah, I think as you as you spoke about that dynamic that was working in that coercive group, it's like. I was thinking about the dynamic in the one taste community and it was like, it needed to be reminded to you that this practice made you and you needed to do the practice and you needed to contribute to the community. And if your relationship you were cultivating with that person was going to get in the way of that, you needed to be schooled. And then somebody was going to try to control your relationship so that you got back on track of like the community and this group is wow. is your first priority that's so so scarily similar to, to Helen's experience when you said the date we had the exact same thing we called it a make out and it could mean sex it could mean literally making out it could mean anything you just call it a make you asked for a make out and then you would go off and do whatever y'all decided to do it's so similar it's weird <laughs> Yep, it's and and Wolf Zendik had this idea that they were gonna um, cleanse the world, and they had all this terminology for people outside of the group. You've been to this session. You've decided that you're gonna fully invest into the One Taste community. Is this where you meet the the the, the brother and you become involved romantically? Um, and how long is it before you go to take part? in your coaching program? 
Yeah, that's when I started my daily practice. I was like, I'm going to do this every day and did. And yes, and then I met him and um, we pretty quickly became, we became regular partners first um, and pretty quickly became more involved than that. I had several other, I plenty of, there were many people who were active in the community. So it was like, I, I probably had somewhere between three and in any given week, I'd have between three and 10 different partners that I would practice with. And most days I was doing two homes a day. I was traveling all around Austin to do these because I was not doing them at home. I had a roommate who was not down with that. And um, yeah, so I was doing that for about six months before I started the coaching program. It sounds like the start of less free time less of your own time that's not solely focused on one taste and the practices yeah living I there was there was a um platform called the ohm hub and I think that for me the ohm hub was removed eventually but um during my time I think that I used that and then just word of mouth of like oh he's a good stroker that was the word they used he's a good stroker you can trust him or he's a really great guy or he's in your part of town or he's about where you are in the practice or he's really experienced um and so kind of like word of mouth from the other women too Mm -hmm. wow so would you sometimes go to these sessions having never met the person face to face before Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. I that is that is yeah. Scary. Katie, that's mm-hmm. like it's it's scary, especially because you're putting yourself in in an extremely vulnerable position. But it's also really interesting that people weird. were just taking Super part weird. in this practice like yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it was all dehumanized. It was totally dehumanized thing, so definitely. Um so many partners in rotation and none of these were sexual in any way just for the own practices that that was the only that was the only interaction that you had with these other people apart from the brother um no I would say things somewhat Things within a few months became sexual with a number of different people in mostly in like the leadership, um, like the leadership, whatever rung of people Um, there. Of course, there was a bunch of sex. I mean, of course, there's a bunch of sex that was happening. And it's not long before people are like, "Ooh, who do you want to have sex with? Who do you want to have a make out with? And, um, there's, there's all of that. And, and so, yeah, I was definitely, I've definitely felt pressure to do that. Uh, and I remember feeling like I'm not attracted to anybody in this community, except for this guy I was dating because there was safety between us. We were actually talking and, um, spending time making sure we liked each other and, um, getting to know each other as people. Um, but, but you had to be okay with him going to stroke other people's clitorises and he had to be okay with other people coming to stroke your clitoris yes yeah oh. maybe that's why it didn't that's work he- out that's a he- yeah that's a heavy <laughs> that's a heavy kind of oof. yeah yes so it it's it's fair to say that sex was pretty common between many people within the community yeah especially for me in the beginning when it was like more casual relationships with people, that was actually, it was actually easier for me at that point because it was aligned with what they were saying, which is like, this isn't intimate. This isn't, this is just experimenting. This is a laboratory. And it was to Mm -hmm. me at that point. And then I got to know those people more. Eventually I would move in with them and they felt like my brothers and sisters. And I no longer felt interested in that, which isn't how everybody's story went whatsoever, but that was kind of how I felt about it. I suppose as well, given the events that led up to you finding the One Taste community, it it probably didn't feel at that point that you wanted to find something 
perhaps as as serious or significant as your previous relationship that ended before you found the One Taste community. I don't know if you've reflected on that and and thought about why it was easier to have those casual interactions at that time. I mean, I think for me, and this is really even after all of this time, I really think it's just kind of how I'm wired. It's like I can have casual sex with people. And I'm, if I'm going to have intimacy with somebody, I'm going to have monogamous intimacy with them. That's, that's, I, that's where I landed. Like I tried it all. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really, I think that's a really key differentiation to make. Mm-hmm. Differentiate, differentiation. Mm-hmm. Is that? I think that, that it, it's important to make that distinction because people often speak about, you know, one night stands and how, there's nothing there's there's no relationship there but when you actually have intimacy with somebody that comes with more than just the physical interaction with somebody as you said kind of the talking um understanding each other talking about past experiences commonalities likes interests making plans together Mm -hmm. that that is different to just um you know having a a physical interaction with somebody so that's the first time I've heard somebody word it in a way where I've gone yes Mm. that's that's the distinction that's the difference Mm. and and what was your but before and then up to this point what was your relationship like with your body in terms of your sexual expression your comfortability with sex do you feel like it changed significantly from your time before one taste and then up to this point where you're going around Austin to meet with your various partners Mm. from from before I came into the community until that point there yeah probably a little bit um yeah I mean really I would say that first experience of oming and that in the in the intro class it was like that was a huge transformational moment I was like so much more is possible for me right now. I have so much more bravery. Like that just happened and everybody's cool with it. Like that, like, you know, somebody literally just stared at my genitals for two people just stared at my genitals for 15 minutes. And then everybody was just really respectful and kind and cool. And we just moved on. There's not all this whole bunch of stuff around it. And yeah, my relationship with my body was bad and probably like most women, maybe even worse um, with dysmorphia. And um, I don't know if you know what dysmorphia is. It's basically feeling like your body is repulsive. Um, I think that was that's just something that kind of runs in my family. And um, it was absolutely an issue for me coming into the practice. And Um, in terms of my genital area, that was gone immediately. Like that was just gone immediately from starting the practice. So I definitely credit, credit that. I think credit is earned in that way. I suppose it's a, it's a great way of realizing that everybody's vaginas look completely different from one another. There's none to the same. Um, I suppose that's a really quick way of (laughs) realizing that (laughs) which is great and and it's great the the body positivity and the the positivity around sex that comes from from this practice or or this switch in mentality as well I think it's difficult to um be sexually expressive without judgment in in the societies that we exist in especially you know going back to where you currently are in the world with a lot of the bible belt existing Mm. around around this the states that surround texas as well as texas being obviously largely involved in christian practices so to be able to have that sexual expression and sexual freedom as well that along with the workshops must be very Sometimes you need to take control to make a difference. That's why with FlexPath from Capella University, you're in control. Set your own deadlines and leverage your experience to move at a pace that works for you. Discover a different way forward at capella.edu. Empowering for for, for the woman after the initial sort of (laughs) lying there with two people. It's kind of like (laughs) 
did when I had a baby and I was just like okay everybody's just oh, yeah, yeah. Every, everybody's just Down seeing there. every part of me um <laughs> yeah and then after that it's just kind of like you know you'd just be walking around with just like an adult nappy on in the <laughs> hospital room and the doctors or nurses would come in and check and you'd just be like yeah I just I just it's over it's done I just there's yeah I don't care anymore um so that's kind of what, what that's reminding me of and I'm, and I'm not surprised you you described that that initial experience of participating in the practice for the first time as dissociating from your body because I feel like that that must be common for 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 for, for a lot of people yeah. did did you ever have encounters with that person that you had the initial session with ever again not much if any I do remember him um he may have been around very briefly but I think he was one of the many people who sort of learned it dabbled and then left it was like not going to be a big thing in his life right right and what about the coach that was observing the session yeah yeah I definitely um I would say we haven't talked in some time but I would say that we're still friends and we still love each other very much and um I don't think we ever actually lived together I think she moved out of the house by the time I moved in but yeah we definitely had an ongoing friendship wow yeah I went to her wedding and (laughs) yeah So you've been to the introduction to Ohm, you've you've witnessed the practice in in all its glory, Mm -hmm. and you've then had the practice done to you in a in a in a session. You're then going to various um partners and you're practicing Ohm sometimes twice a day and driving all over Austin. So we're kind of now reaching perhaps that level of dependency where it's encouraged that you have um involved in every part of your life and then I imagine it gets to the point where you're like I don't know how to do anything without oh yeah the one taste community or the 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 approval or answers to questions that I have on on things that would just felt simple to me before this community and and you said that eventually you moved in so do you do you go to the coaching program with your partner has he already done the coaching program because his sister's in uh more of a leadership role how does that next stage of your journey play out yeah so the coaching programs had numbers so the first one was one called cp1 coaching program one and uh, my partner at the time was in cp7 and then i was in cp8 so i started mine as his was kind of wrapping up and um I was not living in the house yet. I was really attached to living with my cat who was 13. I'd been with her for 13 years and could not take into the house. And so that was kind of a a boundary for me until it just couldn't be anymore. Um, And so that was kind of the, once I figured out how to kind of foster her out to somebody who would just kind of keep her temporarily while I was there, I was ready to go. Um, I was ready to wow. go. Wow. Okay. So you were you were you were already sort of a a, quali- a qualified coach. I wasn't qualified. I was just for, so it was a very long class. It's a ten it's a ten month class, coaching program. Yes, it really drags out. So I was about four months in when it was like I couldn't take it anymore. Like I had to move into the house. I was. It felt like I was starving. It felt like I had no, I didn't have support for what I was doing, like for the pro, this ridiculous program that I was taking, like in order to do that, you have to go home to a bunch of people who have done it too, because you can't go back out into the world and just like go to your therapy job, um, and talk to your coworkers, um, you don't you can't do that it's like whiplash it's like it's it's like a clash of worlds basically right so huge cognitive dissonance at this at this point then you're you're 
I do feel like you're using language at this point that like if we were to have a conversation, I might not even be able to really understand everything that you're that you're saying at that point. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, definitely speaking in lingo and also just living at a level of intensity and a level of like challenging oneself that doesn't it doesn't translate. Um, And yeah, there's just this whole like I would I remember I worked at a treatment center and I would go in and I would do like a two hour group uh, therapy session and I would come back out and I would look at my phone and and some days there were like over 200 unread text messages oh geez okay yeah. okay yeah and do you feel like that there was a, a subliminal or or maybe even obvious pressure for you to move into the house that you weren't going to reach your potential or or, or fulfill what you could unless you were in the house and in that constant environment yeah yes um and that month of the coaching program Nicole was like Nicole was having was mad and she was basically like you all are lazy you all need to be taking this to the next level there's a bunch of this shit going around and um y'all are not in you guys are not all the way in and if you want to grow if you want to get something out of this you all need to go to the next step and I took that like you know like the voice of God and um and a big part of that was because I was spending more money than I'd ever spent on anything on this and I wanted to get the most out of it you know so I was like, shit, I got to do more. And the first thing, like, as she was saying that, it just, I was like, I got to move into the house. That was my mind. Wow. Yeah. So there's the sunk cost fallacy already playing a part before you've even decided to leave the group. Because a lot of the time that, 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 that's where somebody might think I can't leave because I've put all the money or time or, or, or career into into this group so I can't even fathom the idea of just walking away from it so it's interesting that you're having that before you move into the house and do you feel like there was a lot of fear of missing out coming into play as well with other people that were already living in the house totally yeah there's all you know there's so much connection in there complete boundaryless experience but really also like a very connected experience of holding a house together and having all your rituals together, doing all your practices together, which is so much easier to do just to wake up and, and kind of scurry out to the uh, living room and do your practices out there. Do you feel like there's like an elitist mentality for people that live in, in the home of people uh, are kind of like, we're already so much further than you could ever be because we're all living in the house together as Nicole has told us we should be. Yeah. Sorry, I got to tickle my throat. Yeah, I would say um, on a local level, like in Austin, it was, it was, and this is probably true in all the communities, but it was like the cool kids that can, the, the people who had the most connection, the people who are really getting the max benefits from this um who really had a family family um <clears throat> lived in the house and um total fear of missing out total fear of missing out by not getting to be a part of that experience because at that point the events like women's group was in the house so it was like you would go to the house and you'd feel the vibe oh, of the gosh. house and you'd have the group in the house and then you'd have to leave the house, you know, and then the men would be coming home and it'd be like, oh, the men too, you know, they live here too. And um, it would be like, you know, this sort of like summer camp. It's like, you want to be the counselor, you know, <laughs> the camper. <laughs> so what, what was the size of the house? Roughly how many bedrooms and how many people were living in the house at the time you moved in? There were six bedrooms and there, um, one of those bedrooms was an ohm room. One of those bedrooms was what was called a quad. So it had two beds and four people um, in those two beds. And then the rest of the rooms had one bed and each of them had two people in the bed. So there were 12 people living in the house. 
and you're expected not to have sex with one another but you're sleeping in beds with each other so again that kind of feels like an almost inevitability at that point I mean you were expected to not like break out of an ohm practice and start having sex with somebody but you definitely were not expected to not have sex with people you it was encouraged right. that you have sex with people the right people um so it yeah I mean that piece was like controlled it, it was like you guys need to back off you're getting too enmeshed you're getting too involved like you don't want to be in the room it was like if you were in a two person room with somebody you started getting really close with having a lot of sex, having a lot of intimacy, then you would probably end up being controlled and taken out of that room with that person and put in a different room. Um, right. But no sex in and of itself, like it was great. Like have sex, get excited, go do some work for the community, go do something for the house. Great. Sex is great. As long as it's on their terms. And are you with your partner? I feel like we should give him a name. What's a name that's not <laughs> triggering? I will use his actual name. Um, I'll say his name was Seth. Um, Seth. Okay. So are you with Seth at this point? Um, no. I Seth and I broke up um, shortly before. Uh, I was actually for a short period living at his house or like his like in-law suite or whatever. And um we broke up while I was living there. Um, I had asked him to be, to at least give me the status of like primary partner. I'd like to be a primary partner. Um, and that was something, it was a very complicated situation that I couldn't, you know, in case he would listen to this, I don't want to try to overly uh, simplify or uh, so I would say that because we're not on great terms at this point. Um, I would say that, um, we got to the point where neither of us felt safe and we needed to end it in order to go to try to find safety again. And so I moved into the house as a single lady. And I do think there was coercion. There was 100% coercion within the community for me to break up with him. And right. I, I mean, I literally a member of the community told me to tell him something that would end us and I did and it did end us so um wow okay do you feel like he was feeling similar pressures on his end about not making you a primary partner or or kind of not agreeing to some of the the mm -hmm. ultimatums that you may have been presenting him with good question um probably yes I mean I think that he was probably getting pressure to not like dominate my experience there and to where like they probably wanted for him to allow me to have sex with a lot of different people to experiment and whatever um I think looking back he probably felt pressure to do that and was not did not share with me how much it upset him that I was doing that um and it was only in hindsight that I really even realized he was so hurt by that um so yeah, what a mat, what a, what a, like, people outside their boundaries. And you moved into the house as a single person, mm -hmm. and you said that, that, that you, you're not particularly close with your family, so do you have family and friends outside of, of the One Taste community that are aware of this group that you're involved in? A few, I did, yeah, I, I, I did tell my sister, of course, she told my parents, because she was so worried about me, and, um, no, she, wow. How does what? How does she say, Mom, Dad? So I don't even know. Katie's involved in this group where they sh stroke her clitoris. Yeah, I don't even know how she did that. I, to, to be a fly on the wall with that conversation. She maybe just told them to Google it or something, but. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> they definitely Googled it. Um, so so you've got a few people that are aware that, that you're involved. I feel like that's an important um, question just to ask because. Often when people get involved in, in high demand groups, they may decide to forego telling close family members and friends of their involvement in particular groups. Mm -hmm. And it's important to make sure that you are open with your family and friends about the things that you're getting involved in, in case you ever need them to help you 
no longer be involved or be there for you when you're no longer involved. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't believe that there's anything inherently evil or wrong about the group that you're getting involved in, almost like when you're going on a blind date and you tell your friend, hey, I'm going to uh, the charcoal grill Mm -hmm. for a date with this guy called Ted. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you my like location in case you never see me again. Um, you know, just one of those kind of conversations to have with your family. Hey, I'm involved in this new group. Uh, they're really cool. We meet on this day and we talk about our favorite, uh, poems. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. I, I do think that that was helpful. It was, it was helpful to have people. It was also helpful to have purpose outside that I had a job outside of the group I suppose it means that you can't just exist in an alternate reality 100% of the time if there are other people outside of the community that that may have conversations with you and obviously a job outside of that community that means that you can't exist 100% of the time in a in 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 a uh, an insular environment like this this house that that we're exploring a bit now yeah. and uh, your your dependency levels already sound like they're they're on the rise at this point in terms of moving into the house. Oh, yeah. Do you feel like you became restricted with your leisure time? Were you kind of restricted with who you interacted with outside of the movement? Um, were you sleep deprived in any way? Were there any major controlling themes that were coming through at this point that that, that may now? look like earmarks of cult-like methods of control oh yeah I would say I wouldn't say specifically I was like I was not permitted to talk to people outside the group that was the, that was the only thing of what you said that I would say Meh. you know it's definitely like I will say that the group called people who were not in the group muggles which I guess is a Harry Potter term like people who don't have powers um and so that word was thrown around, but besides that, um, you know, I did with what little time I had, um, I did still like I visited my family for family reunion during that time. And, uh, that was all the way to Ohio, which is like, you know, six hours on planes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, um, but yes, I was exhausted all the time. There was a pressure to get up in the morning and have sexual, your body touched sexually, which um, it took until like 2018 or 2019 when that, um, the, the cult, this, the orgasm cult podcast came out. And um, I think Michal was talking about the fact that she didn't want it sometimes. I was like, holy shit, neither did I. Like, I neither did I I did not want that who wants that every single morning yeah, or Monday no. Friday. I mean there's probably all sorts of people listening that are thinking you know when their partner wakes up in the morning they're like hey and you're like no yeah, <laughs> yeah no it's not you can't always be in the headspace where you're you you want your body touched yes. in in oh gosh it must be to force yourself to go through that must just be like then kind of taking away the empowerment and more kind of then bringing in like negative associations with with um you know clitoral stimulation around like oh god I feel lethargic and I feel tired and groggy and you know just associating all those things you feel when you first wake up in the morning with then having your 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 clitoris stimulated yeah wow and I didn't even think about it that way like the first thing in the morning I I do know for years like the first thing in the morning was like um there's just like practice time like I had to do practices in the morning and after I stopped oming I was like I still had to do practices otherwise I would not survive spiritually like I wouldn't I would be asleep I would be you know a, a shell of a human and um yeah yeah I think that's one of those things at that point I started saying like oh omings like brushing my teeth they're really the same pretty much the same thing and it's like that was pretty true on some level but that should never ever be true like that should never no. ever be a thing 
like I can't remember specifically the events that took place around me brushing my teeth today like you know did I start here or did I start here and how long did I brush my teeth for Mm -hmm. like you should never get into a position where you're like I can't remember the specifics of my practice session this morning Mm -hmm. and it's clever that it's done first thing in the morning because if you've had a good rest and a good night's sleep you're waking up and you're being thrown straight into your practices so there is no time to follow a doubt to let a thought blossom into something more than just a niggle at the back of your mind Mm. there's no space for you to distance yourself from one taste it's just everything is just from the minute you wake up until the minute you go to sleep it's it's everything focused around the group so of course there's no chance for you to take a step back and and really question what is going on yeah especially once you're in the house and everybody's just it's all everybody's talking about or practicing or um you know striving for the next level and and doing their coaching program with other people in the house um and and there's there's just so much that goes kind of from from this point onwards do you ever visit the New York or San Francisco groups or Mm -hmm. do they visit you is it kind of like you mingle and, and have a chance to connect Yeah, I definitely, because my coaching program was in New York, um, I visited New York 10 times for that and stayed, I chose to stay in their house. Uh, Usually there was a house in Brooklyn, which Ruan lit where he lived. And um, so that would happen. And, and also people would come through and visit. Also, if I was going to any other city to visit and there was an home house there, you're always welcome there. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of international even connection with, with other people who own. And did you cross paths with Ruan at the times that, that you would visit New York? Wow. That's just so interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He was actually in what's called production, which is like the team that runs event. He did some production at my coaching program. So yeah, I I knew of him. Yeah. And in your correspondence with me when when we were kind of doing the pre-interview preparation you mentioned something in your writing that happened to you whilst you were living in the house around Seth Mm -hmm. and his involvement with somebody else that was quite distressing for you would you say that this was a key turning point in your one taste journey or were things already on the turn before this event happened I would say it was an initiation into living in the house because it happened just a couple of weeks after I moved into the house. Yeah. Um, Okay. Okay. So, so just talk the listeners through the, 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 the events that played out. That's horrible if that's the case. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was a horrible experience. Um, Basically we had an event, I think it was a turn on. And um, at the time I so we were headed back from the turn on and I was driving in the car with one of the people that I lived in a room with so there was I would lived in the quad which there was four people in that room and she was one of the other people in that room and she mentioned on the way back that she wanted to have sex in the house with Seth now and that they talked and that was the plan and it was late I had to work in the morning we share the same room and I was like I would rather you he did not live there he lived in his own house his own house so I said I I would prefer that you do that at his house and she said no that's not what's gonna happen oh gosh oh and she's by the way she's since apologized sincerely for this right Um, yeah and then I got to the house and he was there and I tried to sit down in the home room with him and I said don't do this and he said Mm -hmm. he said you don't own my sex and I jumped up I called him an asshole I stormed out and I just ran out of the house and I just ran and ran um into like and I was still wearing like this the like the skimpy dress, short dress and heels that you would wear to turn on as a leader. And I was running through the streets at probably like 10 PM 
and just trying to get away from the house and feeling really trapped because it was like, I got to go home and I got to get out for work tomorrow. And yeah. my home is no longer a safe place. Like, this is not okay. And I suppose at this point, you're feeling like you have no other choice but to return mm-hmm. to the house. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I that's really horrible. Yeah, I had waited and I don't even know where they if they waited too, if they were trying. I was not really answering my phone at that point. But yeah, I definitely like isn't that safe out there looking how I looked in the streets of Austin like it was not safe. So I I went home and um I basically they were not in my room, but I basically listened to them having sex for a while oh, and laughing oh, and like horrible. But it's horrible it's so traumatic Casey like that shit is so traumatic um and I got really pissed about it and the next day I was very angry and I was shamed for that I was told you don't you do not shame another woman's sex and I shut down at that point I was I there was no other option but to just deal with that sort of thing that's awful and and if it was done on an initiation basis it makes me wonder if it was purposefully fed down from leadership as instructions on maybe how to break a person's will down Mm. um to 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 create sort of more of a, a, a a switched off robotic response from people or to inflict that level of trauma when there's a certain level of dependency on the group at that point or if it was just a combination of things that 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 created that 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 sequence of events and it's not as evil as i'm kind of explaining it to be now yeah. and but it, it, again it sounds so similar to what nicola talked about in her book a slice of orange where she had a, a boyfriend who she loved dearly mm-hmm. and they weren't allowed to to practice monogamy when they followed Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh they would be um as you put it they would be labeled or or they would be spoken to in a negative way mm. you know that it was something that they were doing wrong they were trying to stop other people's progress in a certain way or they were trying to restrict people because of their feelings and their emotions and you weren't allowed to be um individualized in that way or selfish in that way and and so when her boyfriend was um you know having relations with other people mm-hmm. and they were coming up to her and saying wow your boyfriend's really good in bed mm-hmm. and she would say yeah i know like she we we had this really lengthy discussion in our interview about how some cultures may practice polyamory but in my nature it doesn't feel natural it doesn't feel like you can't, it, it, it doesn't feel like there's a situation where I wouldn't get caught up in my thoughts and feelings. And I know that there are people in our culture that practice polyamory. And I hope that it's in a consensual and safe space uh, where, where none of these things that we're discussing now ever happen mm. to another person. Um, because what you've experienced there is like truly heartbreaking where you feel so trapped that you have no other alternative but to go and sit in that environment where you can hear what's happening around you that's that's just so so awful yeah and I don't think that anybody did that on purpose necessarily and you know I think it was sort of like if you're going to live here this is what you you need to be able to tolerate this and what what's your journey like onwards after this point Mm. is is your relationship with the community soured from this point or is it something that you write off and and throw yourself further into the one taste work I it's probably something in between those um I definitely you know I I took it as like this is the reality if I want to do this if I want to have this if I want to grow if I want to heal that's, that's so ironic that I would say that if I want to heal, then I, this is what's going to have to, these are going to have to be the realities of my living space now. And, and what was so difficult was that there was one of my close friends who was in leadership. Um, when I came into the community, she was dating one man. 
Um, and then a new man like came to town and she ended it with that man and started dating this man. They were all living together through that. And it was like watching them do that it was seem it was relatively seamless. Like the guy she had just broken up with seemed cool with it, super cool with it. And there were a number of people in the community that seen in that house that seemed t- totally like turned on even by their partners having sex with other women. And and maybe that's just what was happening more more so in public, but nobody was having the reactions that I was having to these open relationship situations where I didn't feel safe. Like I, I felt like I was losing my mind. I was losing my grip. And, um, I really wasn't seeing that reflected in other people's behaviors, which was, that was like, okay, this is a me thing, not a them, whoever's hurting me thing. Like this is, this is a me thing. I was going to ask if you kind of felt like it was just you or if people were perhaps potentially masking their true thoughts and feelings because they didn't want to get that that kind of pushback from the group or 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 the the negative labels that would be applied to somebody who was trying to you know restrict somebody's sexual encounters. I honestly don't know. I mean in the years since I've my one thing that I've thought of is it's attachment wounds. It's like my attachment wounds are very abandonment based. Other people's attachment wounds are more like smothering based. So they actually feel better when they have like a, when their partner is having sex with somebody else. So they don't feel smothered by them. Um, I don't know what it was exactly, but that's, you know, I was one of the outliers. I think like I had one of the biggest reactions of the, of the, small group of people here that you know that I compared myself to (laughs) and how far into your five-year tenure are you at this point where this event happens not not quite one year yet oh my oh my goodness I thought you were going to say maybe like three or four years Mm. so you have like another four Mm -hmm. or so years in this group after this event happens yes and two more wow two more open relationships that start with the man saying this is going to be an open relationship I'm not going to have a monogamous relationship with you I, I will be with you both of them were willing to be my primary partner neither of them were willing to have a monogamous relationship and I kept trying oh (laughs) this is horrible Horrible. this is horrible all of these things that individuals may experience outside of the one taste community Mm -hmm. feels like it's now happening inside but like exacerbated because so much focus is placed on the 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 orgasmic meditation practice itself right yeah I mean there was definitely a lot of trauma I'd say for everybody there was trauma that was happening along with any growth and and healing that was happening I think we've all had to you know those of us who've really gone back and reflected and want to move on um, and that's definitely not everybody I would say we've had to heal from the trauma that's happened um, but also love some of the growth that happened it's very confusing yeah um, there, there are definitely people who would say they weren't traumatized, m- more so like the people who are probably at the top, the top of the uh, food chain. Sure. So this is like one year in. <laughs> oh, I haven't even talked about all the trauma from the first year. <laughs> oh, there, gosh. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you're involved for another four, four. years yeah. and you're you're waking up every day. And you're going through the, the 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 orgasm meditation practice every single day for five years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And how? What what do these four years look like? I just um, can't. This is this is wild. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I would say like the first year, the first year was 
intense. Um, and some of the things about that first year were like really easy healing. Like it was like stuff that was ready to heal. I just needed the right place to do it. Um, and I was able to grow in certain ways that, that first year, there was also a, a bunch of trauma that first year. There was a bunch of trauma the whole way through, um, going into like the second year was when the company boomed. So the company made like the Forbes list of like 11th small, small, like the 11th fastest growing small company. And then all of a sudden my ex now, he started a house and then staff wanted to go start a house of their own for like the real, you know, like the real people who are really quote unquote devoting their lives to orgasm. Um, the people who want space to do that 24 seven, basically. Um, so now we have three houses. There were later be four houses. Um, and so I'm moving around after my coaching program ended, I took a way back seat. I was like, this is too much. And I moved into my ex's home and where he lived with his now girlfriend uh, which was actually fine. Like I was past it as somehow miraculously I was past it. And we were able to be friends at that point. Um, and then that was another year. And then um, the community was like, there was just some faltering going on in the community. I don't even remember what it was but there was a split that was happening and my house was becoming like anti one taste. And mm -hmm. I was very adamant. Like I was very protective of, of, I wanted to protect like mama, <laughs> the mama part of this operation. And so I was definitely combative with them. And I was like, I'm leaving. I'm going back to the other house to support them and keep this thing afloat. Um, so I did that. I became more of a leader in that house, but things were changing and it was different and it was less, the staff was not there. So it was like more toned down. It was less structure, which bothered me sometimes. And I would say I became more of a leader and I would say at some points I was heavy handed and was becoming, you know, I was trying to keep something going that I was taught. Um, and there are things about that that I regret. I regret interactions with people when I came down hard on them or I was just kind of needlessly trying to be rigid just for rigidity's sake. Um, and yeah, I think I at some point in that, I, um, this, I, I started a new relationship. I brought somebody new into the community. We started a relationship and that ended up lasting for like a year and a half. And that last chapter, he was my last chapter of that experience. And so when he and I ended, I officially left. I had actually left the house six months before that because I couldn't live with him. He wasn't willing to be monogamous at all or even ethically non-monogamous. And he and the house at that point it was a lot of sex workers who were it was it was a completely different scene it was like a bunch of sex workers and him and then a non an ethically non-monogamous or sorry a non-ethically non-monogamous person who had just moved in they had more experience um and i like my life was so traumatic at that point like i couldn't get away from the trauma even living all the way across town. Um, and so eventually I was able to leave, leave that relationship, which meant I could not, I could not go back in with any of those people because they all had sexual relationships with him or, you know, could. And um, that helped me get out because I was like, I really can't. Like, I, I literally need to get to a place of safety at this point and that the only way to do that was to get out of that relationship and get out of that community wow oh my goodness so pretty significant four years like it, it's it's kind of 
there's probably just as much to discuss in in the other four years as there is to discuss in the first year even though we've missed stuff out of discussing uh discussion points in the first year um and, and something that I was going to ask you uh about um about one taste is do you feel like it was inevitable the 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 like sex workers would end up living in the house or that this would invite a certain clientele in how do you keep something that involves sexual practices even if it it's not being done in a, in a necessarily sexual way with the the orgasm meditation what well, how do you stop that from spiraling into something like what you've just explained I mean, I definitely over the years, I mean, I saw plenty of people turn to sex work just to pay for classes, to pay for how expensive it was wow. to be a part of that group. And I've heard Nicole tell people that in order to pay for classes, they should engage in sex work. Oh. I've literally heard her in the same room say that. So, um, and, you know, the, the person who had sex with Seth in the house, like she was also a sex worker. So it was happening. It was already happening before that. Um, and, you know, I think I'm I have the privilege of being of having been given access to education and a higher education that was that enabled me to get a license and a career that's good, well paying. And some women are not. And if you want to do something like this, that's expensive or really, you know, just have the means to live an independent life, that is what many women choose to do. And so um, that was in the beginning, I would say the women who were doing that were just trying to be independent and live a quality of life they were trying to, and they didn't have the same, you know, they didn't have the same start that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and, but over time, I think what happened was there was kind of like one sex worker in the community who was making her own side business out of it right. and was in, in, you know, basically getting other people to engage in it and rent out her space to do it. And, and kind of, tr she's trying to get out of it. Like everybody's trying to do, mm -hmm. trying to get out of it the only way you know how and so it's tough yeah, isn't it it's it yeah I, I have a lot of empathy and um I don't I don't understand enough about it to speak you know it's necessarily speak about it in an educated way it's I guess that that answer gives me enough insight to realize that there there were people that that were abusing the system that was in place, but there were also some people that were relying on the system to get by, to provide for themselves in a certain way. I, I just worry that, that those types of environments, I mean, I say that like it's typical to find this type of environment. Of course it's not um, because I've, I've, I've never come across an, another group that's exactly like One Taste. Uh, we've mentioned Zendik Farm being quite similar with their, their take on, on sex and relationships. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I don't know if I'm thinking like the children of God in the back of my head and how that situation with the flirty fishing that, that they encouraged, uh, where um, women were encouraged to go out and uh, proselytize to men using their bodies, uh, which basically mm. just meant uh, prostituting themselves for God, as it was kind of written in in one of the letters that that that, that came down from leadership. It, it it does perhaps pave the way for people that might identify as pimps to get involved and take advantage of the situation. I don't know if I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate in in um, in thinking about the worst scenarios that could come out of a, a group that focuses on stimulating the the woman's body in such a raw and an open way mm -hmm. yeah I mean at the end of the day one taste was a multi-level marketing thing and sex was all interwoven in that so yeah that totally lends itself to the creation of 
sex work as well as finding a multi-level way to create that. But I suppose the absolute worst part of this is that the 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 matriarch is encouraging women to put themselves in those situations to continue taking part in the events of the one taste community that that to me is kind of I guess what I meant at the start of the episode when I said that 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 Nicole goes full circle with experiencing her own sexual trauma and then founding the one taste community and then encouraging women to potentially put themselves in situations where they too may experience sexual trauma yeah yeah and I think most of us did um most of us women and then the men were kind of encouraged to act in ways that created that you know perpetrating that or or experiencing it I don't know I'm sure that happened as well so you you mentioned there that the the last relationship that you had within the community before you decided to 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 walk away completely was with somebody that you had recruited into the community so was this a common practice in one taste were you were you uh taught how to recruit people or was it just an expectation that you would go out and find people to bring into the fold it was kind of an expectation. I was definitely not one of the people who was recruited into that role. There were definitely a ton of people who were in sales. I was not, I'm not salesy. Um, I'm not, I'm not into that. And I was put in production cause I'm structured and organized and responsible. So, <laughs> um, that, I, that just happened. You know, I, I met him on a dating app and he had already heard of it and he was like, yes, I did not, was not ready for it then. I'm ready for it now. Let's do this. And just like dove in head first, just like I did a few years before that. Mm -hmm. Right. So at this point, you've progressed from using platforms like Meetup to uh, dating apps and and websites, Mm -hmm. which is a good, which I actually was going to mention that I know that (laughs) some Jehovah's Witnesses um, and, and other religious groups use dating apps to kind of, you know, throw, throw the, the, the hook the bait yeah, the carrot. yeah. What, 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 what. I think <laughs> no totally I think there are definitely people who are doing that I personally was pretty ambivalent about him coming into the community to be completely honest like I wanted him to grow but I honestly did not I didn't want to bring him in there it was an open relationship nightmare <laughs> like I wanted him to myself yeah, and yeah, yeah. um yeah, so I didn't, I was on those apps to have other relationships outside of the community, for God's sake. <laughs> Do you feel like there was more cognitive dissonance there with the the, the, the kind of two ideas fighting against one another where you're like, I, I do want to recruit people because I know that that's good for the community, yeah. but also I don't, you're not ready to come into the One Taste community because because you're not ready because it's not, it it's you know, it's not good here um, or it's not for you. It's not. (laughs) Do you feel like that was something you experienced? I still believed that it was the way to freedom. And I also selfishly, not selfishly, but at the time I felt selfishly, it's like, I, I would rather have somebody to myself. I'd rather have a mainstream relationship. And that's really where I was heading. That's really what I needed and still need is just a normal freaking relationship um where there's safety absolutely absolutely and I think that that is not even something that people should feel lucky to have it's something that should exist in all relationships whether they are monogamous or polyamorous um in whichever way you would define your relationships with people they should always be safe and respectful um and that is that is what should be normalized in in you know I I my my partner is incredible at um really sharing the role of parenthood um mm. and he actually really likes to take the kids out and have you know one to one time with them and he he really strives to give me time to do my podcast work to to get exercise in and i i try to do the same for him when he's not working because of course he has a full time job on top of all of those things i just mentioned um, with mm. him trying to pursue his project and, and his fitness and people always say to me oh you're so lucky he does 
the amount that he does. And he he hates it when people say that because he's like, I'm just doing what any other parent should do. And he's he's 100 percent on the money when he says that. So, you know, people are, oh, you're so lucky. You're so lucky that he does everything. And then I say, well, he wouldn't agree with you there. He would just say that he's doing what he should do. Oh, but you're lucky that he thinks that way. So there's just no way around it. Um, But yes, (laughs) it's just what a sad world it is when you're so lucky to have that. It's like why that should be a norm. That's yep. You're you're yep. You're so right. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess that leads us on to the last sort of section of, of our discussion is to, to talk about your life since you left the community, what happened to the community itself. Um, I believe that it's not in existence anymore. Um, I think Ruan mentioned something about uh, Nicole selling the business um, mm-hmm. so I think that that there's been a lot of shifts and change, changes since since your um, departure from the group so I wondered if you could just talk us all through yeah. your your exit and and what what that looked like. Yeah I think Nicole sold the company to a number of co-owners um, who are like wealthy um in 2017 ish and that was my third year or fourth year that was my fourth year there and um you know I think that was kind of like the beginning of the end and um you know she it was clear that she was also really triggered by having a relationship with somebody who she brought into the community and began having sex with her friends um that was finally out there like that was finally put out there and and she left shortly thereafter um and then you know at some point there was a bloomberg um published an expose on the group and there was an fbi investigation that fbi came into kind of like the headquarters at that point and seized people's cell phones and laptops and all of that um I knew some friends who were involved in that and and probably have a trauma bond because those are the folks who are still going the the group is still going it's just uh last time I checked it's called the home institute right yeah and yeah and so geez things shut down on the local level homes houses closed on the local level and I began putting more attention for me. I began putting more attention on my life and my business, which I had had that whole time. Oh, it gosh. became mm-hmm. it became so clear to me that I could make so much more money by being able to focus on my like actually like make an income, the income that I needed to by focusing on my business. Um. And so, you know, I healed, I'm still healing financially, but to be able to back away um, and put my, put my attention on my life, which I wasn't able to do for more than four years. um, That's, I, everything changed drastically for me at that point. Um, And I'm definitely one of, you know, I'm definitely not talking to many of the people in the group, which I think a lot of us are kind of like, maybe there are a couple people in our circles that we still see. There's still an Austin, there's still a women's group that I think is still kind of doing its thing in a different way. Um, They've invited me and I'm not interested. Um, And yeah, I think at the corporate level or at the headquarters level, people are still trying to sell this thing. Wow which is, which is frustrating to me. Like I wish people would let it die. Like it had to die for me. I had to get completely away from it in order to get myself back and get back in like the reality of life. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, there's still, there's still, you know, the group is still trying to save people. And um, Nicole, as far as I can tell, is taking zero responsibility. The other corporate um head honchos both of the Rachels in particular Rachel I would say Rachel Cherwitz in particular um 
I think caused a lot of trauma to people, a lot of financial trauma, a lot of emotional trauma saw myself and, um, and to myself, to me. Um, I'm, I don't feel that anybody has really taken any responsibility for the damages that have been done, mostly financially. Here in Austin, um, Seth's sister um, definitely is, you know, she's incredibly wealthy and she owned the affiliate here. Mm. She was, pay- she paid me when I was on staff, she paid me $500 a month, um, for basically working. I was probably working a hundred hours a week. Oh um, gosh. Oh my goodness. For that alone. Yeah. So, you know, she, I remember her saying when she sold the affiliate back that she broke even. And this is somebody who had like a custom made home. Her brother has a custom made home. Neither of them need to work a day for the rest of their lives. And I feel very angry about the people who have financial burdens for the rest of their lives who like never recover. Um, And, you know, I remember her saying I broke even and to, you know, it, it did not bother me then as much as it bothers me now to understand um, the fallout from that. I finally, um, I think it was in February, I paid my last payment. Of, I had to consolidate my debt because I went into, oh God, $35,000, $40,000 worth of debt. Wow, oh my goodness. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm happy to say that I'm done with that. I was so happy to be done with that debt, but still a huge cleanup process. Um, so I just want to say that because I know the people who listen to this, many of them are, will never have the same financial opportunities as people who have gotten to spend their money on their own stuff, their whole adult lives. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a, a huge financial burden, which of course, every time the money comes out or every time you need to make sure that you're making enough money to repay those payments, you're reminded of the reason why you're making those repayments yeah. in the first place. And everything that I spoke to Janice Selby about when, when uh, a, a, a counselor for religious trauma, she was talking about the anger that people feel when they come out of these movements because of things like the sunk cost fallacy, because of everything that you've put into this group, financially, yeah. emotionally, physically, time sexually (laughs) yeah five years is a significant amount of time to put into this group and not just to put into it but you you moved in you devoted your entire life and everything to this practice so of course you're going to feel angry at the people that benefited from the trauma and abuse that that that, the others went through and 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 everything else that we've discussed in this episode today and all Mm -hmm. of the stuff that we haven't had a chance to discuss in this episode so not only have you got this kind of financial burden and reminder of everything that that you went through but you've also got the anger and the trauma and the and the emotional things that you're trying to go through so without the the debt there's still so much to deconstruct and unpack and heal from and understand the financial stuff on top of that is is probably and and I I am confident to say it 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 most likely has been the difference between life or death for some people that that are involved in high demand groups the 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 financial strain on top of everything else it it probably has been a factor that has caused somebody to either successfully end their life or attempt to mm. great that you've finally been able to pay that off but so frustrating that you were in that position to begin with and then nobody's taking any accountability or responsibility I'm just one there were I think there were 18 coaching programs so that's ten thousand dollars from you know 150 people 18 times um and or maybe even a hundred we'll just say a hundred to be safe I don't even do math well but you can imagine that's an enormous amount of money and that nobody is taking any responsibility for that sucks I hate that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I hate it for my friends who are in worse shape than I am financially um, and just yeah that anger is still there and you know luckily I, I have been able to focus I've been able to get some health care and I can focus on 
I'm with an individual therapist. Always. I have an individual therapist. I see every week. And now I have a group therapy that I do, which is so helpful because it is an environment where my cult stuff gets triggered all the time, but it's an environment where I can say, this feels culty in this moment, this dynamic is going on right now. This feels culty and the people around me will listen and they will adjust themselves if they are doing something that's coercive or controlling or manipulative. And that's the difference between, you know, a high demand group and a group that's just being a group and it just went off the rails a little bit. And now it's going to come back and everybody's being taken care of. And the insight that you have into that world of coercion and manipulation is perhaps stopping some of these groups from turning into potentially one of those <laughs> types of environments. So that's kind of like a full circle, really interesting <laughs> thing that would probably take us a really long time to unpack in it, in itself, just as a small little detail. But I just think that it's, it's incredible that you were able to hold on to your own business the entire time, no matter how... Yeah how strong your dependency was on the group, how much pressure you were feeling from the group to be further involved, to throw more money down on on more courses and more coaching, to be involved with partners who didn't want to, to be monogamous, to go through that repeated trauma of those things, all of this stuff that, that, that you've explored in this episode, to hold on to your own business throughout all of that, and still have it on the other side is a monumentous achievement because I imagine there must have been times where you thought it's in the way I'm just gonna focus on on one taste you know my business and the time I'm putting into it I could you know move up the move up the ladder in one taste and and get employed and and paid that way I'm sure that that crossed your mind at some point the fact that you have your practice now that's completely yours that 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 has nothing to do with one taste that that you can accredit entirely on yourself solely is absolutely incredible and i hope that you recognize that on the outside of everything else that that, that, that that's happened when you feel kind of those flushes of anger and and you mm. and you go through some of the events that that took place or some of the things that that you were coerced into during your time after all of that there's one thing that they didn't take from you one thing that you never gave up on and that was your own business that that is yours I just think that's great yeah thank you that's true it's so true it's thank you for reminding me <laughs> it's just I, I I just love having conversations with people when they say these things happened now I have my PhD and I'm like <laughs> oh my goodness all of these things happened and I still have my business I just think that's I just think that's absolutely incredible and and I am I'm really thankful for your time today I know that it's probably I don't know how it feels for you but for people to talk about their bodies in such ways um mm. it's probably not not something that's comfortable for for many people and I know that it's a a, a a difficult five years that that you went through so I really do appreciate you giving us your time coming here to give us your insight into these experiences I'm sure there's so much that you've given in this episode that others can take with them um as as either red flags for groups that they are involved in or groups that they may come across or or groups that loved ones might be involved in and some steps on how to manage those those traumatic events on on the other side when people do do find their way out of these types of of high demand groups to to access therapy if you're able to in the way that you have and uh and just to know that there there is a world where people can express themselves sexually and it doesn't have yes. to be taboo, but it's a very fine mm -hmm. line between empowering women and traumatizing women. Yes. 
And I think one of the reasons why this fringe group exists and why it goes too far and all of that is because we don't know how to just talk about sex amongst women or from mother to daughter or from sister to sister. We don't know how to do that. And we have, we have to do that better. We have to open up about what's happening. And as mothers, we have to talk about it or, or give our daughters a name of somebody that they can talk to. Um, so we can say like, I'm not satisfied in sex or I, sex hurts me or like, I am not attracted to this person or this person pushed me too far, but it wasn't right, but it didn't feel right. You know, we need to be able to talk about that better. And, um, you know, it's, it takes a lot of courage, but just like my experience with having that first ohm, if you do it in a safe space, you can keep doing it. It will open up the world for you to just be able to talk about sex, about your body, about relationship the hard stuff (laughs) I think you're just yeah really so right with everything that you've just said and I'm thinking there about conversations that my mum never had with me and then I'm thinking Mm -hmm. about conversations that I should prepare myself for for, to have (laughs) with my daughter who's not even (laughs) one yet but I'm already thinking oh but but yes you are right um of course the 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 one taste community is probably primarily attracted to people who are like wow I've never experienced just this I've never just experienced a, an environment where people are are trying to be in tune with their bodies in it you know in a in a sexual way so um yeah experiencing pleasure women experiencing pleasure and women saying do this a little to the left softer you know um never mind I want to end this you know like all of these things mm-hmm, mm-hmm. women don't get conditioned to say any of that no, do any of that no absolutely not absolutely not so there's the, the 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 sex side of things but there's also the relationship side of things as well that I feel people don't discuss or talk about um enough so more education yeah. more sex and relationship education and positive conversations around sex positivity and female empowerment and that's our big takeaway from today's episode yeah I love it and I'm here for it yes great okay (laughs) so thank you so much for your time today Katie thank you for coming and opening up to us and, and giving us an insight into all of these things and I really hope that you enjoy the rest of your day thank you so much Casey for all you do here it's wonderful take care Katie bye you too bye that is the end of this week's episode If you'd like to get in touch, you can find me at coltvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at coltvaultpod. I am your speaker, Casey, host of the Colt Vault Podcast. Sometimes you need to take control to make a difference. That's why with FlexPath from Capella University, you're in control. Set your own deadlines and leverage your experience to move at a pace that works for you. Discover a different way forward at capella.edu.